Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, good to see everybody in again for this half hour. And uh, again, the first thing I'm going to remind you before I forget is we are now in book number 56. And my little wife over here reminds me to tell you that because it's so much better if you call and said, well, I want a tape of the program. Well, what book is it? Book 56. And of course, it's up here on the board. Again, uh, in case someone of you are hearing us for the first, and it's over and over in the honey. We get letters from people who said, I just saw your program for the first time. So if you're one of those, uh, we always like to have you know right up front, we're non-denominational, I'm not trumpeting any one group, and I hopefully never attack anyone, because uh, I feel I can get a lot more response by just simply showing what the book says and uh, let it speak for itself. And so. Uh, hopefully, we, uh, we do not create any enemies by attacking. If they can't stand what the book says, then I can't help that. Then that's their problem, not mine. But anyway, uh, search the scriptures with us. Compare scripture with scripture. And uh, remember, someday you're not going to stand before the Lord and plead that you are loyal to your denomination. That's not going to hold water. But uh, you're going to be judged, as Romans says, according to Paul's gospel. A lot of people don't know that verse is in the Bible either. That's what Paul says in Romans 2.16, that every man will be judged by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And, of course, that's why we, we hold forth the Pauline scriptures as paramount, not the only, but they are paramount because, of course, they're written to the Gentiles in particular, the Jews, of course, as well, during this age of grace. So uh, this is our ministry, to just simply teach the book and help people to understand it. All right, we're in 1 John, and I thought we'd get almost through chapter 2, but we didn't make it, did we? We only got through verse 2. So uh, we're ready to go into verse 3. Yeah, Jerry's got it on the board. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. Now again, I'm going to be constantly showing you how Jewish and in accord with the four Gospels, all these little letters are. Now this next verse just rings a bell. This isn't Paul. This is John. Hereby we know that we know him, that is Christ, if we, what? Keep his commandments. Now goodness, where does that ring a bell from? Well, go back with me to Matthew. Matthew. Chapter 19, and every time I use this verse, I have to remember a phone call several years ago where a lady called and she said, Les, I'm totally confused. And I said, what's the matter? Well, it says, yesterday morning my priest's subject was Matthew 19, and look it up with me so you'll see where she was coming from. Matthew 19, verse 16 and 17, and that was his sermon. And she says, this morning, your program, you're telling us we're not under the law and the commandments, we're under grace. Now I'm confused. Well, now I didn't bring you back here to confuse you. I brought you back here to see how this is the exact same language that John uses in his little epistle as is used in the Gospels. All right, Jesus is speaking in Matthew 19, verse 16. Matthew 19, verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good Master, what is good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life. And he, Jesus, said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, that is eternal life, keep the what? Commandments. Keep the commandments. That was his answer. All right, now then come back to 1 John, and the Spirit now inspires John to write, since we're dealing with believing Jews, not Gentiles, we're dealing with believing Jews, and he says, if you really know the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, then you'll keep his commandments. Now, I'll be first to admit that he's not talking about just the ten now, but he's talking about all the ramifications of the law. 
but it's still the law that he's dealing with. See? All right, so he says, if you really know him, you'll keep his commandments. Verse 4, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Well, that's basically what Jesus told the Jews of his own day. All right, verse 5, but whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the what? The love of of God. Now remember what I told you in the last program? John is the apostle who is the epitome of love. And you're going to see it throughout his writings. The love of God as it's brought out through this disciple of love. Alright, so the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Well now I know somebody's going to jump at me and say, now wait a minute. John is using the same language of Paul, of speaking of being in Christ. Well, it's not in the same connotation. Come back with me to John's Gospel again. And uh, the chapter on the vine. Chapter 15. And it's the same kind of language. Now, that's what I'm going to be doing from these little epistles. I did it with Peter. You remember several months back? I took the very same words that Peter used and showed you that it was what God told Moses in Exodus, that you are a kingdom of priests, you are a peculiar people. All those same words Peter used in his little epistle. Well, it's the same way with John now in his epistle and in his gospel. All right, John's gospel, chapter 15. And remember, there's nothing of the gospel of grace here yet. This is all kingdom economy. And verse 4, John 15, verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. See? As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide where? In me. See the language? I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing, and so on and so forth. So the whole concept of these Jewish believers being in Christ or in Jesus and Jesus in them, that was nothing new, but it's on a whole different plane than what Paul teaches as being members of the body of Christ. All right, back to 1 John. So verse 6 again, just to, to ring the bell coming out of John's Gospel. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. See? Now verse 7, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. Well, now, goodness sakes, as John writes, what's the beginning? His earthly ministry. As he begins his earthly ministry, this is what they've been hearing. Love. Love is the fulfilling of everything, see? All right? Verse 8. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth, and he who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. All right, let's go back to John's Gospel again, and let's go back to chapter 3. Well, let's chapter 1. My goodness, the whole Gospel of John is full of these things, the light and the love. All right, John's Gospel, chapter 1. Oh, let's start at verse 3. We don't have to finish 56 in 1 John, do we? <laughs> we'll take as long as it takes. All right, John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 3. Again, John, in agreement with Paul, is giving creation, or giving the credit for creation, to Jesus the Christ. All right, so verse 3. All things were made by him. By Christ. He's the creator. 
Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was, now here it comes, was the what? The light. See? In him was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness. And darkness comprehended it not. Now he goes on. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And of course, that's the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the what? The light. L-I-G-H-T capitalized. The light of the world, see? That all men through him might what? Believe. There, there you have the potential again, see? It's all there to be appropriated if they would just believe it. All right, now verse 8. He, John the Baptist, was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. And of course, that came out of the Old Testament prophecy, didn't it? Malachi wrote that there would come an announcer, a, a proclaimer that the king was coming. All right, that was John the Baptist. But now verse 9, the light is Christ. That, that is Jesus, was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now there's a verse I've said before. I can't comprehend it. I don't expect any human being to comprehend it. I don't know how he did it, but he did because the book says so. And there again fits right with what I said in the last program. When Christ finished the work of the cross, he was able to offer forgiveness to the whole human race. A done deal. He was able to offer reconciliation to the whole human race. It was done. But it didn't do them any good until they appropriate it by faith. Well, the light the same way. This light lighted every human being that has ever lived. And don't ask me how. But that's what the book says. Read it again. Speaking of Jesus, who was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now, that doesn't take away our need for missionaries. But on the other hand, it explains why Paul says what he says. Now, I guess I better go there. Keep your hand in John. I'm not through there. Come back with me to Romans. Chapter 1. Where before I saw John 1, 9, I again was up against it with this verse. Romans 1, verse 20. And I still can't explain it except for what John says. Romans chapter 1. Now this is Paul. Verse 20. Romans chapter 1. Dropping down to verse 20. All set? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Every human being has some sort of an understanding of that. Consequently, and this is what I say, I couldn't, couldn't understand for the longest time. Consequently, they are without excuse. Awesome, isn't it? That's why the masses of humanity out there in darkness are lost. They're going to eternal doom. I don't care what the universalists say. I don't care what anybody else may say. The scripture teaches that they're going to an everlasting doom. But they don't have to. Because they've had the light. And since they've had the light, God in total justice, as Paul says, can send them to that doom and they don't have a word of excuse. Now let's go back and see how it happens in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. 
These things aren't proclaimed much from the pulpits anymore. Most people are afraid to. But look what it says. Revelation 20, verse 11. I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, Jesus the Christ, of course, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, there was found no place for them. <clears throat> now at the great white throne he saw the dead, all the way from Cain, I think, as the first lost man in the human race, <laughs> to the very end. And they all stand before God. Now God, in this case, will be Jesus Christ. And the books, plural, are opened. And then the book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead, the lost, all the way back to Cain, the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. The sea gave up the dead, death and hell gave them up, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The first death was physical, when they went from this life into the tomb. The second death is when they will be removed from God's presence for all eternity. And then verse 15 settles it. This drives the final nail into it. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's plain English. There's no gobbledygook to it. All right, so now then, when you come back to John's gospel, the reason God can cast them into that eternal doom is because they had received enough light to have escaped it, but they rejected it. And we're seeing it all around us. My goodness, you try to talk to people about the truth of Scripture, and they either turn away or they get mad. But God be God. All right, back to John's Gospel. So he was that true light, verse 9 again, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now then, speaking again of Christ, he was in the world, in his earthly ministry. And the world was made by him. He's the creator. But the world knew him not. And I've said it on the program. Do you ever stop to think? that the Roman soldiers that drew, drove the spikes into his hands were created by the one whom they were killing. The cross came out of a tree that was made by the one whom they were killing. The hill on which it stood was made by the one whom they were killing. Can you feature that? And yet he never lifted a hand against them. Okay, read on. So he came unto his own, the nation of Israel. Proclaimed that he was the one they were looking for. But in their unbelief, they what? They received him not. But to them that did receive him, he gave power to become the sons of God. To them that believed on his name. In other words, recognized who he was which was the heart of the kingdom gospel, to believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be. And so throughout John's gospel, then, you have those two concepts. In fact, let's go to chapter 3. I was going to go back to John first, but uh, John's gospel, yet chapter 3. <clears throat> All right, come down. Oh, verse 19, 20 and 21. John's Gospel, chapter 3, 19, 20 and 21. There's still that light concept. That's why I came back here. Verse 19, and this is the condemnation that light, see, light is come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hates the light, 
neither cometh to the light, lest his deed should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought. All right, let's go all the way back to the Old Testament a minute. Honey, Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42. Just to show you that this is a total continuation of my timeline that we had on the board here several programs back. That everything from Abraham all the way through the Old Testament, Christ's first coming, his ministry, his death, burial, resurrection, his ascension, and then the tribulation and the kingdom was all part and parcel of the prophetic scriptures, prophecy. All right, back here in Isaiah. This is prophecy. Chapter 42, verse 6. Isaiah 42, verse 6. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. Now, I think here it's speaking of the nation of Israel. And I will hold thy hand, and I will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people. For what purpose? For a light to the Gentile. See? And so this whole concept of God's light being shed abroad is nothing new. It came up out of all the prophecies of the Old Testament. It was part and parcel of his earthly ministry. And now with that past, now these little epistles, especially John back here, is again going to epitomize the light factor. All right, 1 John again. 9, repeat it. That's where we just left off. He that saith he is in the light. In other words, he is a believer. He has recognized that Jesus is indeed the light of the world. Now, if he says he's in the light and hates his brother, well, then he's a liar. And he's in darkness even until now. He's not in the light. He's still in darkness if he hates his brother. Now, verse 10, but he that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is no occasion of stumbling in him. But, now here's the other side of the coin again. He that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walks in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness has blinded his eyes. All right, now Paul speaks of a blindness. Come back with me again to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where Paul also speaks of a blindness. And a light. Both. Alright? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 3 and 4. But, Paul writes, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? Lost. Lost. The lost person is stumbling in a spiritual darkness. He can't see to put one foot ahead of the other, spiritually speaking. All right, verse 4. In whom? These people walking in spiritual darkness. In whom the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of them who believe not. Lest the, here it comes now, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So who keeps the light from shining into the heart and mind of the unbeliever? Satan does. And he'll use anything and everything at his disposal. Now today, I think, people are being blinded with activity. Everybody is busy, busy, busy. Materialism is all they can think about. And then on top of that, we have all the smut and the rot of, a, of an immoral society. And all of this is part and parcel of Satan's veil of darkness. 
to keep people from seeing the light of truth. All right, back to 1 John. Verse 11 again. Repeat it. In light of what Paul just wrote in Corinthians, I think this is so apropos. He that hateth his brother is in darkness. He's in a spiritual darkness. And he walks in darkness. Now, have you ever walked in pitch dark? Boy, it's just about enough to drive you inside out, isn't it? And uh, you, you just don't know what to do next. Pitch darkness. Well, that's where the lost person is. He is just constantly fumbling and stumbling, not knowing which way to go next, all right? So he says, he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and he walks in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth. Isn't that true? They have no concept of eternity. They have no concept anymore of right and wrong. My, I think with every passing week, it's getting truer. That these people are calling white things black and black things white, right things wrong and wrong things right. It's just compounding. Why? Because they're stumbling in the dark. Okay, read on. I write unto you, verse 12, little children, because your sins are, what? Forgiven. Now remember, he's writing to Jewish believers, still in the kingdom economy, but they had experienced forgiveness because they recognized who Jesus really was. All right? Verse 13, I write unto you fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. Now that a king, you can take it either back from the beginning of his earthly ministry to the nation of Israel, or you can take it all the way back to creation, however you want to do it. But he's from everlasting to everlasting. All right? So he says, I write unto you young men. Now he's speaking in terms of family ages, the fathers to the sons, because you have overcome the wicked one, I write unto you little children, now we're coming down to the younger element of the family, because you have known the Father. I have written unto you fathers, because you have known him from the beginning. And I write of the God who abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. How did they overcome him? By their faith. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.